have uh, two very eminent uh, faculty from Artemis Hospital. Uh, we have Dr. Rawan Powell, uh, who is Powan Rawal, I'm sorry, who's the head of the Department of Gastroenterology at Artemis School of Health. We also have Dr. Ramdeep Ray. Uh, he is a, the Joint Director of Liver Transplantation Program at the same hospital. In the panel of experts today, we have a, a bunch of uh, rising hepatologists of the country uh, and two of my friends as well. Uh, we have Dr. Abdullah Mahmood. Uh, he is uh, working at Chittagong Medical College in Chattogram. Uh, we have Dr. Farah Hussain Mahmood Shahid, though I don't see him, probably he's yet to join. Uh, he's an assistant professor of hepatology at the Dhaka Medical College. We have Dr. Saiful Parvez. Uh, he's an assistant professor of hepatology at Mukda Medical College in Dhaka. Dr. Zia Haider Boshumia, assistant professor of hepatology at Rangpur Medical College in Northern Bangladesh. We have Dr. Ahmed Lutfulmovin, assistant professor of hepatology at Kubi General Hospital in Dhaka. Dr. Shaukat Hussain Romel is an assistant professor of hepatology at uh, Sir Salimullah Medical College in Dhaka. We have Dr. Abu Saleh Muhammad Sadiqul Islam, assistant professor and head department of hepatology at SZM Medical College, Bogra. And finally, uh, we have uh, Swet Abul Faiz, he is an assistant professor of hepatology at Sirat MAG Osmani Medical College. So, without taking any further of your time, we'll go on to the presentations. We'll have the two presentations at first, then we'll have a question hour session, answer session, and finally, opinion from the expert panelists. So it's my pleasure first to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Pawan Rawal, uh, who's the head of the Department of Gastroenterology at Artemis Hospital. Uh, he did his uh, DM in Gastroenterology and Hepatology from PGI Chandigarh uh, and has 15 years experience of uh, uh, practicing gastroenterology and hepatology with uh, lots of international publications and national international conferences talk to his credit. So with this, I invite Dr. Pawan Rawal for his uh, talk on hepatitis B uh, from a hepatologist's perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mahmoud. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, Association of Study of Liver Bangladesh, your team and team Artemis also for bringing us together on this platform. And uh, I thank everyone for joining in this late evening today. So I'll cover the medical part where I'll just talk about hepatitis B. Since I've been told that the, the audience would be both mixed of internist and the hepatologist, I, I try to have a balance between the two groups of people who are listening. So once we talk of hepatitis B, the objective would be to talk about a virus epidemiology, natural history. We'll talk about the diagnostics. We we'll talk, talk about the initial evaluation once a person who is infected with hepatitis B presents to us. We'll talk about treatment criteria, whom to treat and whom not to treat, and then follow the guidelines, which are the three major guidelines. And we'll talk about the candidacy of treatment as well. Then the treatment indications along with the drugs available right now. The important part of hepatitis B treatment as compared to hepatitis C is when to stop treatment. We'll talk about some stoppage criteria and the guidelines available. And of course, then we'll follow up these patients. We'll talk about some relapse and management of the relapses and a couple of slides for the treatment which are in pipeline. So three guidelines, which are major guidelines uh, of focus of interest would be the APASL guidelines, EASL guidelines, and the WSLD guidelines. The newest are the WSLD guidelines 2018. So when we talk about epidemiology, we know that hepatitis B is a significant healthcare burden. Worldwide, more than 250 million people are infected with hepatitis B, contributing to the majority of deaths uh, the number of deaths occurring because of hepatitis B related liver diseases and hepatocellular carcinoma is significant. There is a mixed trend of uh, increase and decrease. Some countries have managed the, the prevalence by uh, in, uh, improving the socioeconomic status and giving a lot of vaccination and effective treatment. But then the prevalence in some countries is still the same. We, both countries, they fall in the risk of 2 to 4% prevalence of the hepatitis B carriers. We know about the virus, it's a double shelled virion. It's a DNA virus, which is partially double-stranded. I want everybody to focus on that. It's a partially double-stranded DNA virus. A lot of genotypes, so eight genotypes, A to H. We'll see the significance of genotyping in later part of the presentation. In India and Asia, the commonest are the A, B, C, D. And India, what we know of the A genotype is dominating. And we know that hepatitis B is quite an infective virus. It has more than 50 to 100 times infectivity as compared to HIV virus. So we need to take care of this virus as much as possible. Just a slide about the replication because we need to focus the treatment on this. Once the virus uh, enters 
these cells through a receptor, which is NTCP receptor. The DNA is exposed. It goes to the nucleus where there is a repair of the DNA followed by there is a formation of triple C DNA. That's a covalently closed circular DNA leading to the transcription and formation of the proteins. Transcription leads to HPE antigen, HBC antigen, which are the core antigens. And there's a new antigen, it's called as hepatitis B core related antigen, followed by the formation of HBS and uh, HBS particles. And then there is a reverse transcriptase action leading to the negative strand, then positive strand, and then formation of a full virion. The drugs available these days, which we are using, they act on the later half of the cycle, which is the reverse transcriptase part of it. The nomenclature, uh, I know everybody knows it, but I want to highlight the change in the nomenclature, which has happened over the time. The nomenclature previously, which was immune tolerant, immune reactive, inactive carrier has been changed, uh, especially the easel guidelines. They don't recommend to use this terminology. Now the immune tolerant phase, which was previously the early part of phase. So suppose a person gets infected, or I would say there is a vertical transmission, an infant gets infected, he goes through a phase. Initial phase is around 10 to 15 years, where the virus is there. It is quite in significant number, leading to the high DNA and high HBS antigen. But there is an immune tolerance kind of situation. There is no injury to the liver. Here only I want to highlight is the damage to the liver caused by hepatitis B is immune mediated. The direct viral toxicity usually doesn't happen. So T lymphocytes, they mediate the damage to the liver by the virus. So immune function needs to be there or immunity has to be there if you expect some damage to the liver. So initial phase, there is virus high, which is DNA high and HBS antigen high, but the damage is minimal. After this immune tolerant phase, it goes to a phase where the virus is actually playing with the immune system and immune system is trying to eradicate the virus. There will be fluctuation of the ALT because there will be damage to the hepatocyte at this level. The DNA also would fluctuate and the HBS antigen levels would also fluctuate. Now, if immune system wins over, the virus will almost be eradicated leading to the low DNA virus in phase three and low HBS antigen and even the ALT would be high, the inflammation would settle. But in Asian population, especially the person enter into phase four where they enter into a phase of Pre-core mutants, where the DNA will be low, but the, still the histology would be bad, leading to inflammation, high ALT, moderate to severe hepatitis, and moderate to severe rise in HBS antigen quantification. And finally, this is the lucky phase. Somebody should have it: is the clearance of HBS antigen, clearance of virus, and no histological problem. So this is what everybody wants in the natural history of hepatitis B. We know hepatitis B is a bad disease. Uh, once there is acute infection, if this is vertical, it means it happens in infancy, then most of the changes would be chronic and the conversion to chronic would be very common. That will be the tune of 90%. This 90% decreases to 5% if the transmission is horizontal in case of adults. Once there is chronic infection, there will be inflammation, there will be reaction of the body in the form of scarring leading to cirrhosis. And finally, it will lead to either liver cancer or liver failure. And if we, Dr. Ramdeep or liver transplant team doesn't intervene here, finally it leads to death, in, especially if the treatment was not there. Now, hepatitis B DNA, you know, gets incorporated into the host DNA, where, where it actually, actually interferes with the proliferation. And hepatitis B is one of the causes of HCC where cirrhosis may not develop. So some people of hepatitis B or some patients of hepatitis B would develop HCC even in the absence of cirrhosis. And that's a very important point to be taken care of. Clinical features are like any chronic hepatitis. Initially, it can be just a fatigue, loss of appetite, malaise. Sometimes there's a right upper quadrant pain. But if person develops chronic hepatitis leading to cirrhosis, the person will develop complications like any complication of cirrhosis in the form of ascites, bleed, encephalopathy, Hepatorenal syndromes and others. And finally, person would have the symptoms because of that. Extra hepatic symptom, which I want to highlight here, which probably should be taken care of uh, once you are analyzing the patients, can be arthritis. Some may present with dermatitis. Very rarely, a uh, nephrologist will call you for glomerulitis and he finds that you be symptom positive. And very rare as compared to hepatitis C would be cryoglobinemia and polymyalgia rheumatica. How to evaluate? So point of interest to the hepatologist would start from here, actually. The evaluation of a person who presents to you in outdoor practice or in IPD would actually go by the natural history. We know it has five phases. So you may pick the patient at any phase of your hepatitis B. 
So at any point of time, the job of a pathologist is or a physician is to find out three things. What is the status of virus? What is the status of damage to the liver in the host? And what is the environment like? That means what are the risk factors in a person around or him that can lead to progression of disease or progression to the CC, thus requiring a close care. So with regard to virus, we need to know about HBE antigen, which is a marker of replication, or sometimes we have anti-HBE positive. We need to quantify the virus in the form of hepatitis B DNA, so hepatitis B DNA quantitative. Quantification of HPS antigen is very important. I will talk about its relevance. So these days we are doing it. If there are no financial issues, we quantify the HPS antigen. And of course, we don't want to know about the concomitant viruses which can spread by the same route. That is hepatitis C, hepatitis D, and HIV. So, so that we can take care of them together. In host, we want to know what the virus has still caused to him. So we know about the ASTALT, that is the liver function test. We want to know about platelets because they are the marker of portal hypertension. We want to find out kidney function. It's very important because you need to give drugs where the dose modification may happen because of the kidney dysfunction. So preferably try and calculate the GFR. Then of course, we want to know about the status of liver in the form of fibrosis. We use FibroScan, which is very, very good and available, but some people can use the non-invasive marker, especially the FIB4 or the uh, AST platelet ratio and ultrasound abdomen, not only for the liver damage, but also for finding any kind of mass or the HCC at the outset. We need to his risk factor, the higher age, male gender. We need to know his family history, whether they're HCC or not. We need to know the obesity. Do calculate body mass index because obesity plus hepatitis B is a bad combination. Look for the risk behaviors. Look for the uh, pregnancy if it is uh, we are dealing with a reproductive age group females. Then, of course, definitely go for family screening because there are chances that you will find some more people who will have hepatitis B and your job is to vaccinate those people so that they are prevented from this deadly virus. There is some role of uh, viral resistance testing, which is very optional. We may not talk about much. A genotype, we believe personally, if uh, there is a person who is able to do the genotype testing, we should preferably do it because they have the effect on not only management, but on the relapse as well. Giving some example, genotype A uh, has a better HBS antigen loss with treatment, especially the PAG interferon, and relapses are much more common in uh, genotype C as compared to A. So given the chance, I would like to go for genotypes as well. So once we have a patient, we have analyzed, we have evaluated, what are the goals? The goals are same as in the any case, any, any, any chronic disease actually. In any chronic disease, we want to improve survival and we want to improve the quality of life. So we want the prevention of disease progression. In this case, we want to prevent the progression to cirrhosis and we want to prevent the HCC and then failure and the deaths. So the main endpoint, how do we achieve this is by suppressing the DNA. We will suppress HB antigen and we like to have a HB antigen zero conversion if we are dealing with the HB antigen positive patient. We want to have a biochemical response in the form of ALT normalization. And though unachievable and a very you know, dream sort of is the functional cure, the HBS antigen loss. Everybody wants that, but the treatment right now available is not very good to achieve that. But this is the cure that we everybody wants because HBS antigen actually is a surrogate marker of triple C DNA. And it has been seen that if there is HPS antigen low, that actually would be the cure we want to achieve. So how to select the treatment? We don't need to treat everyone. We know that in the natural history, you may find a person in immune clearance phase, immune tolerance phase as the previously known. So if immune body's immune function is able to take care of the virus and the virus is not in good number, then you may need not cure, treat, uh, actually treat them. So the treatment criteria are based mainly on the ALT level, which actually reflect the inflammatory activity. And they are based on the virus DNA level because the most of the drugs which actually we are dealing with are antiviral. So if ALT is more than two times the upper limit of normal and the DNA is more than 20,000 international level, this is the definite indication to treat. If the levels are intermediate, then probably you can treat if they are high risk. That means if the age is more than 40 years or on fibroscan or biopsy, there is fibrosis F2 or more, then you can treat them. And if ALT is normal and the DNA is very low, these patients actually are the candidate where you need just to need to monitor and follow. The criteria are almost similar in HPN to negative patients, but we know the DNA level in HPN negative patients are low. So the criteria of 20,000 will go down to 2,000. Other criteria will actually persist the same. Current treatment available is in the form of uh, pagintoferon 
and the oral antivirals. Or antivirals, I will not talk about lamivudine, adifovir, and the previous drugs because they are almost out of practice. We will talk about antikavir, tenofovir, desproxil, tenofovir, alafinamir. The point of interest I want to highlight is the PEG interferon is a finite duration of treatment. You just need to treat for 48 weeks. The antiviral, which are oral, they have an infinite duration. We'll talk about that as well. Then second point is the HBS antigen loss which is extremely low with the oral antiviral, especially in HB antigen negative patients, which is probably around eight to 10% in PAG interferon alpha, though it's still there, but it's again very low. Third point is the treat as the route of administration. People sometimes don't want any injections, so they go for an oral antivirals because PAG interferon have to be given the subcutaneous route. And last point, which is very important to be seen is the safety concern everybody knows PEG interferons they require a lot of monitoring they have significant side effect especially in the cirrhotic patient so this also is, forms the one of the criteria now once we have actually selected the drug what are the efficacy efficacy we see that the dna level will fall in most of the patients so the suppression of dna is quite adequate we can see up to 90 percent but the target we want to achieve, that HBS antigen loss, is extremely low in both the groups, whether they are HBE antigen positive or whether they are HB antigen negative. So till now, the treatment available will decrease the DNA, but will not achieve the functional cure in significant number of the patients. That is an unmet need right now. So once we have chosen, we want to go for oral antivirals, how to choose antikavir over the others. We know that the tenofovir group actually has issue with the renal, has issue with the bone mineral density, and issue with the pregnancy. Anticavir is a pregnancy category C, so we prefer to use tenofovir because it's a pregnancy category B. If there is a risk of renal disease and the loss of bone mineral density, especially in elderly people, prefer anticavir, otherwise prefer the tenofovir, tenofovir dysproxyl or tenofovir elafinamide. Now, how to choose between the two, tenofovir elafinamide and tenofovir dysproxyl? We see that tenofovir elafinamide is a prodrug of tenofovir. And the difference between the two comes because of the plasma stability. You see the plasma stability of tenofovir elafinamide is quite high. So rather than being excreted in the kidney, the concentration of drug achieved in the hepatocytes would be much higher. So the kidney dysfunction would not happen much with tenofovir elafinamide. The dose modification is not required much with tenofovir in case of elderly people and the potential patients who have chances of kidney dysfunction. And the dose required will be much less. That's why the dose of tenofovir elafamida is 25 milligram as compared to dysproxyl, which is 300 milligram. And studies have shown the comparable efficacy between TAF and TDF. So you can choose either of two depending on the category of patient you are dealing with. So whom do we select anticavir over TAF would be a people who are aged more than 60, where the chances of bone disease and renal dysfunctions are high. The resistance pattern, if we find out, is quite good with the newer drug. And if we focus on the three major drugs we are dealing with, anticavir, tenofovir, and TAF, actually, the resistance is almost unknown with TDF and TAF and very rare with anticavir. So these are the drugs who have high genetic barrier and very high potency drug. Mainly the resistance would not be a major issue in these groups. So, now, once you have started treating, you have chosen the, the treatment, how do we monitor these patients' own treatment? These patients need to be monitored for the ALTST because they are marker of inflammation. Look for the renal dysfunction, especially if you have chosen tenofovir dysproxyl, and you can switch the therapy accordingly. The most important part for a hepatologist in case of hepatitis B as compared to hepatitis C is for how long? How to discontinue or can we discontinue? especially if you have chosen nucleoside analog as a treatment. That's a major question across all uh, the countries in the world. Now, the guidelines which have come across from ASLD and EASL, they vary a little bit, but what we practice is the EASL guidelines where they say that nucleoside analogs, if started, can be discontinued or should be discontinued if there is a confirmed HPS antigen loss. That's, a, that's, that's actually is a rare event. But suppose you have achieved this, you can discontinue. They can be discontinued. This inverted coma can be discontinued in HPE antigen positive patient without cirrhosis. This means if there is advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, you should not stop them. It's for lifelong. 
if there is no advanced fibrosis and patient hb antigen positive and if you have achieved a stable hb antigen zero conversion and you have given a consolidation treatment of one year then probably you can stop them but then the caveat would be a monitoring the person should be ready for close monitoring post stoppage now third is the nucleoside analog may be discontinued in hbe antigen negative patient again the hbe antigen positive patient you can stop them if you have consolidated the treatment and there is a zero conversion but the problematic patients are hbe antigen negative patient which are in abundance in asian population here if with cirrhosis you cannot stop them if without cirrhosis there is some chance of stoppage if you have achieved long term virological suppression that is more than or equal to 3 years now i want to discuss it little more because we have hepatologist in the audience suppose you have taken a decision to stop what happens if you stop the nukes especially in the hb antigen negative there will be a relapse it has been shown that is that passage of time one year two year three year four year rather in both the groups there will be a significant relapse of the hepatitis b dna if you stop nukes and here comes the role of the hbs antigen quantification it has been seen that the major risk factor for hbv dna relapse once you are trying to stop nukes would be the age age especially more than 40 years and a high hbs antigen level again it has been proven that if you have done hbs antigen level at the outset at the start of treatment in between the treatment and the end of treatment the persons who had the lowest level of hbs antigen at the start in the between of the treatment at the end of treatment would have the least chance of hbv relapse so that forms a guideline where we should do hbs antigen level at the outset and we should monitor them as well other criteria would be the type of nukes suppose we have stopped the tenofovir the relapse would be little early the relapse would be later in case of anticovir group but you see at the end of two year the relapses are common so the relapse may be little early with the tenofovir group but the finally at the two years and the ultimately the things are same and other things is the genotype so again i want to highlight why the genotype is important is the relapse in type c is much more than the type c type b so seeing this the relapse and the 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 coming up of the, the dna why should we stop nukes at all i mean this actually brings you a point that we should treat them lifelong whether it's hp antigen negative or whether it's been positive especially in hp antigen negative we should treat lifelong because ultimately the relapse is going to happen but here we need to justify we when we stop nukes what are the advantages of stopping nukes so this happens post discontinuation so you are treating this patient here the dna level comes down alt comes down once you stop the treatment here there will be a there will be a flare the flare will be the hepatitis b dna frail will be in the alt but what it results is the hbs antigen loss so this is what we want this has been shown once you stop the nucleoside analog in case of hepatitis e antigen negative patients after the flare person will lose hbs antigen which actually is the target and this has been amply shown in the studies where they have shown increase in the t cell activation marker post discontinuation thus corroborating the loss of hbs antigen in the virus and even it has been shown that if you don't if you don't have patience if you don't if you lose patience and you tend to treat the flares early the early retreatment actually will lead to lower hbs antigen clearance so one has to have patience when if you have stopped the nucleoside analog in case of hbs antigen negative patients and post discontinuation the person will go through these phases initially there will be lag phase everything would be fine then there will be a flare reactivation and then person will go in consolidation phase now the point of interest why i'm showing this diagram here is the flares here in reactivation phase can be risky sometime they will lead to acute liver failure so there is a role of monitoring post discontinuation people have suggested that don't stop nucleoside analog in patients who are not ready for monitoring or rather don't stop if you are not ready for monitoring the monitoring can be as fast as every four weeks the dna has to be repeated every four weeks alt has to be repeated every four weeks in case you have taken decision to stop nucleoside analog in hp antigen negative patients and wherever you find that there is flare which is risky that means there is increase in the bilirubin there is a confirmed sustained increase in the prothrombin time or there is a confirmed elevation of alt more than 10 times upper limit to normal at any point of time or there is rise in alt 2 to 5 time time which is persisting you need to start the retreatment practical rule what we follow and which has been suggested by easel is this 
where in HP indigent negative patient on nucleoside therapy, we see the viral suppression. Suppose you have achieved viral suppression for three years, you see whether your patient is cirrhotic or not. If patient is cirrhotic, please don't stop the treatment, continue for life. If patient is not cirrhotic, see whether you and your patients are ready for monitoring or not. If you and your patient are ready for monitoring, then comes the role of HPS antigen level. We are talking for last maybe a couple of slides also. See the HPS antigen levels. If HPS antigen levels have fallen to less than 200 to 500, this is a group of patients you can stop and monitor. If you have not achieved this, tactically here we don't stop and again continue the nucleoside analog. This is the rule or protocol or algorithm that we follow here. Now, a little bit about resistance, though we have seen that resistance is not common in the group of the nucleoside analog we treat, but in case you develop the anticover resistance, you have to switch to the tenofovir, either disproxyl or alafinamide. The second uncommon group is the TDF or TAF resistance, which again is extremely uncommon. The option of treatment would be anticover. Now, coming again to another form of treatment, a single slide about PEG interferon monotherapy. There is still a role to treat uh, patients of hepatitis B with PEG interferon in case the disease is mild to moderate and patient preferably is HP antigen positive. The duration is 48 weeks and there is, uh, there is a, I mean, the role of HP antigen quantification here also to follow the people who have been treated with PEG interferon and you can stop the interferon at 12 weeks if there is no significant fall of HP antigen or DNA levels. A slide about combination therapy, enough studies which have shown that if you combine PEG interferon to long-term nucleoside analogs, not much change, but very small increase in the HPS antigen loss you may achieve. So still in the pipeline. People have combined two different potent nucle and nucleoside analogs, but the difference was not much. The HPS antigen loss was almost similar. Now last maybe two or three minutes for the special group of people. In cirrhotic patients, if I just summarize, Basically, you have to treat. So in, especially in the decompensated cirrhosis, any level of HPV DNA is an indication of treatment. Use the safer drug because the chances of side effect would be more. The tenofovir alafinamide, of course, would be the treatment of choice. There is one group from ASLD which actually tells that in compensated cirrhosis, look for DNA. More than 2,000, it indicates treatment, and less than 2,000, it does. It actually needs to monitor. But what we follow in our setup is we tend to treat every patient who is having cirrhosis, whether compensated or decompensated. Liver transplant will not talk about. Dr. Ramdeep is here to talk about the liver transplant group. The co-infection. Suppose you have a patient who is HIV and HBV co-infected. Please go ahead with the ART schedule. Follow the CD4 count, and all patients should receive a. TDF or TAF based ART, that's the drug of choice. HDV, we group, I mean, India, it's not common. We receive patients from Uzbekistan and the CSI, CIS countries. The HDV doesn't respond to nucleoside analogs. The preferable regime would be PEG interferon, especially for 48 weeks. In HCV, suppose there is a co infection, you have to treat hepatitis B if it's filling the guideline. The problem happens once you are treating hepatitis C with direct antivirals and the hepatitis B is not very active. But then there are chances that hepatitis B will reactivate or flare. So you need to closely monitor these patients of hepatitis B who are co-infected with hepatitis C and you are treating with the direct antiviral. There's a role of prophylaxis for 12 weeks by some groups. Pregnancy, uh, if suppose you are dealing with a pregnant woman, it's a role of a gynecologist to screen for HPS antigen in every case. And suppose there is a pregnant woman with chronic hepatitis B with advanced fibrosis, please treat with the tenofovir. That's a category B drug, avoid integral. Suppose there is a pregnant woman is actually on nucleoside analog therapy from pre-pregnancy part. If she is receiving tenofovir, please continue. If she is receiving anticovid, probably switch to tenofovir. This proxyl because it's a category B. Now, suppose you have detected a pregnant lady having HBS antigen positive uh, group, but initially not on any therapy and not a candidate of therapy, do her DNA level at 24 to 28 weeks. If the DNA levels are high, more than 200,000 international per ml, then start TDF for prevention of the transmission to the baby and continue till 12 weeks post delivery. Breastfeeding is not contraindicated in untreated patients. 
If patient is on immunosuppressive therapy, we know that the hepatitis B related damage is immune mediated. Once patient is on immunosuppressive therapy, the damage may not happen. But once you remove the immunosuppressive therapy, there will be immune reconstitution leading to the damage to the hepatocytes and very significant flares. So every malignancy, if you are going for chemotherapy, test them for hepatitis B surface antigen and test for the total core antibody as well. If HBA antigen is positive, please give prophylactic therapy. If HBA antigen is negative and core antibody is positive, you have to give prophylactic therapy if you are giving a high risk chemotherapy, especially the anti CD20 therapy like rituximab, or you are giving a stem cell transmission, trans transplantation. The preferred prophylaxis would be a high potency drug like anticavi, TAF, or tenofovir desproxel. You have to give during the chemotherapy and for at least 6 to 12 months post the immunosuppressive therapy. Renal patients, uh, you have to treat, suppose there is HPS antigen positive dialysis patient. If initiating treatment, prefer anticavir because uh, the TDF is not good in that, or you can go for the TAF. If there are HPS antigen positive renal transplant recipient, you have to initiate prophylaxis because they will be on immunosuppression. If the patient is HPS antigen negative and core antibody positive, then there is actually no indication of prolexis or treatment right now as compared to chemotherapy. Extra hepatic manifestation, if you deal, they res may respond to antiviral therapy. Data is very poor. You have to avoid PEG interferon because they may worsen the immune mediated extra hepatic manifestation because of the immunomodulatory effect. Acute hepatitis B, very difficult to differentiate from a flare. Do three criteria which I want to pass on to the PGs over here is if a patient is having a high anti-HBC level, or the hepatitis B DNA level is significantly high, or there is presence of HBE antigen and anti-HBE, then probably you are dealing more with the flare. Most of the people who have real acute hepatitis B, they don't require treatment, rather 95% they don't require specific treatment. If you are dealing with the severe hepatitis B characterized by coagulopathy or there is a protected course, or then only there's an indication of starting the nucleoside analogs. And definitely, if they are going into the failure or ACLF, they should be considered for the liver transplantation. Future therapy, I will just go by single slide. I won't talk much about it. Just a point I want to highlight is the if you go by the replication cycle, right now you are dealing with the drugs which are acting on the reverse transcriptase. So we are actually acting on the late phase of viral replication. The drugs which are available or, or in the pipeline are there which are acting on the all phases. They are either entry inhibitor, like the, there is a data on Mirplex D or Azitimabai. So there are drugs which act on the RNA interference. There are drugs which act on the capsid formation. The still, uh, there are nothing uh, which is available in phase three or uh, I mean, potentially for next couple of years or more, there is no drug which will be available. So I just uh, stop it here and come to the conclusion. So I conclude as a carry home message would be that hepatitis B is a significant healthcare burden. We have seen the prevalence. Important is to have a proper case finding and the treatment. Selection of patient is very important. You need not treat every patient. Body's immune system may take care of. Selection of appropriate drug is very important. Go for appropriate drug as for the candidacy of treatment, either pack interferon, oral antivirals, then among oral, you have to choose either of three. Stoppage rules are very important. We are dealing with HP antigen negative patient in quite a number of the uh, people in Asia, rather in India and Bangladesh. So stoppage criteria already have highlighted quite a lot we should follow because the relapses are very common. And parallelly, once you are treating, screen your patient for HCC because that actually will alter the nature and history and can lead to significant morbidity and mortality. So with this, I will thank for the patient listening and thank from the team Artemis and gastroenterology department. Thank you. I'll stop sharing these slides. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Pawan Rawal. Uh, I think uh, we'll have, uh, benefit, we have benefited from your talk and uh, after Dr. Ramdi Pray's talk, we'll have the question answer for you as well. So it is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ramdi Pray, Joint Director, Liver Transplant Program at Artemis. Uh, uh, he's a Bengali, so I'll take the privilege and finally invite him in Bengali. Ramdi Babu and Aftar Pala. Okay, so I think I'll start by sharing the screen.
just keep it going. it visible yeah we yeah, can see visible. the slide yes yeah okay. so i'll start on a little lighter beat Well, I thought I'll start by showing this video just to highlight the importance of organ donation, uh, which is important across all countries, definitely in our country, and I'm sure in Bangladesh as well. <clears throat> uh, uh, onik dhunnobad, uh, salam alaikum, adab, namaskar, apnadir shobai ke. Uh, <clears throat> it would have been better if I were there in Dhaka and it would have been non-COVID times and we could have participated, me and Dr. Bhavan Rawal together. Uh, but under the circumstances, webinar is the only way forward. Uh, I'll be talking about liver transplantation. I will be focusing at a very basic level because uh, I understand that there are uh, postgraduates here who are not hardcore hepatologists yet. So we'll be talking about liver transplant in general and hepatitis B a bit in particular as well. So these are the patients whom we talk about. The patients uh, in this uh, image, the idea is not just to highlight the fact that the patient has jaundice, but it is to highlight the fact also that the anxiety in the person's eyes, because this is what liver transplant is all about. This is what the life of a recipient is all about, waiting endlessly for an organ. Be that a deceased donor or a living donor, there is so much uncertainty around the availability of an organ, uh, who will donate an organ, uh, when an organ will become available, and if it's uh, someone in the family, then uh, expecting someone to donate the organs also becomes very tricky within the family as well. So we talk about these patients, we talk about ascites, we talk about uh, abdominal distension, but imagine waking up to see this kind of a tummy, imagining hiding this kind of a thing inside your, you know, uh, under your clothes. This is the kind of suffering that our patients actually go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is the kind, we say patients have hematemesis and melina, but imagine going to a sink and seeing this kind of blood and the kind of anxiety, uncertainty and suffering. So when we do all these discussions, when we do all these things, when we have patients who have HCCs, these are the kind of patients whom we are treating. And the idea behind liver transplant is to target the suffering of these patients. Who, which are the patients who we talk about, about when we talk about liver transplant? Patients with cirrhosis and patients with relatively early stages of hepatocellular cancer. And these are the patients in whom the liver needs to come out. Cirrhotic livers, unhealthy livers like this. So when patients have liver cirrhosis or CLD or end-stage liver disease, whatever we call 
uh, the disease and the cause may be different kinds of causes we are all aware but the focus uh, you know depends on the cause now uh, at our hospital in the last 5 6 years we have operated we have done liver transplants on patients from 25 different countries more than 25 different countries and it's become uh, you know whenever a patient comes from a particular country so it's a person from india then we would think it would be either alcohol or non alcoholic uh, uh, liver disease nephrol more common than other causes if a person comes from bangladesh invariably the first thing we think is hepatitis b if the person comes from pakistan then the person invariably we would think about hepatitis c hepatitis would be much hepatitis b would be much less common in pakistan as compared to bangladesh a person coming in from myanmar uh, first thing we would think would be uh, hcc it's so common there a person comes from uzbekistan we see hepatitis b hepatitis c and very often we see hepatitis d as well and you have alcoholic liver disease also we have someone from iraq we have hepatitis c yes we also have autoimmune hepatitis being much more common so although uh, their countries are sometimes neighbors but there's a very different uh, uh, perspective that we get when we look at these patients from different countries because of medical tourism so yes bangladesh and india hepatitis b is a very big problem which dr pavan rawal has very nicely discussed today so these patients with cirrhosis and early stages of cancer the liver needs to come out and if you look at this liver as compared to the previous liver so this is not actually a patient with cld but is actually a liver of a patient with acute liver failure you see here that the surface is relatively smooth but the color is completely changed it's greenish because it's a necrotic liver as opposed to the nodular liver that we see in chronic liver disease so indications for liver transplant typically would be cld or acute liver failure patients with cirrhosis sometimes need liver transplant that is when they have decompensations decompensations can be different forms uh, no point discussing this with a pathologist who are much more aware the sum of the complications are more sinister than the other complications especially sbp hepatic encephalopathy hepatorenal syndrome and if there is already development of tumors hccs then uh, we would counsel them for transplant with some degree of urgency when to transplant yes we would decide more by the child book uh, score and the melt score and you look at the points and nowadays we just go into a calculator and look at the child book score and yes patients with child a don't need a transplant child c definitely need a transplant child b we would decide on a case to case basis depending on the nature of the decompensation the other option is a melt score but Uh, the melt score should traditionally is not a score to decide whether someone needs a transplant or not the melt score is basically to decide more that if you were to have a category organ then who should get a priority who should get the organ first so that would be a greater score but yes we do get an idea about the degree of decompensation and the idea of the severity on the child score and the melt score as well and <clears throat> if it were a case of acute liver failure traditionally we still follow the king's college criteria to decide decision making is very very important because we need to decide if the patient is bad enough to need a liver transplant and also to decide whether he is good enough to benefit from a liver transplant we would not want to transplant too early no one no patient would like to have a transplant early so the idea is that it should not be bad enough Uh, it should he should be you know earning a liver transplant but at the same time should should not be he should not go be so far gone out that the chances of success with a liver transplant is too little how do you balance uh, whether someone will benefit and what is the risk so there has to be a balancing between the recipient transplant benefit the recipient chances of benefit with the transplant whereas if the patient were to wait then what is the chance of morbidity and mortality while waiting for a transplant so this balance this equipoise between the two is very important so this is the liver that would come out but where do we go with a begging bowl looking for a new liver unfortunately in many countries including india and bangladesh this is a very common 
scenario, road traffic accidents leading to death. But death is not the ultimate tragedy. Very often, another tragedy follows, where along with a brain dead person, very often healthy organs are either burnt or buried. If only these organs could be used. So please, please spread the message of pledging your organs and spread saving lives across boundaries, across all countries. This is the message that really, really needs to go across. But till then, the solution is living donor liver transplantation, which is the large majority. And when we look at international patients, because international patients would not get organs uh, from cadaver organs, so living donor liver transplant is the only real option when patient travels beyond borders. Uh, the story of Prometheus and Zeus, some of you may be aware that uh, Zeus was the Greek god of fire. And uh, so Prometheus stole fire from Zeus. This is my favorite story. I have to tell it every time. So Zeus, uh, uh, Prometheus stole fire from Zeus and gave it to mankind. Zeus was completely angry. How can you give fire to mankind? Mankind doesn't know how to behave responsibly. And so... Uh, Zeus uh, sent an eagle to punish Prometheus. So you see here in this picture where Prometheus is chained to a rock. That is his, puni that is his punishment. He's chained to a rock and an eagle has been sent and the eagle comes, tears through his abdominal wall and eats up the liver and flies away and comes back the next day to see that the liver has grown back. The eagle then eats up a part of the liver again, flies off again, and again comes back to see the next day that the liver has grown back. So every single day, the liver grows back. The idea is that Prometheus is trapped in eternal pain. Every single day, the eagle would give him, would inflict pain, but the liver would grow back. The idea being that he would not die, but his suffering would continue. But the message that we liver transplant surgeons get from is that the liver grows back. It doesn't grow back as rapidly, but it grows back within a few weeks to months. And that is the basis of living donor liver transplantation. Although we have one liver, but actually it is eight small livers which are packaged as one. So these are the eight segments of the liver. And if you divide the liver, the remaining liver, even if you have 30% remaining liver, the 30% goes back within a few weeks. So in an adult living donor liver transplantation, usually the right lobe is given to the patient. If it's a, ch a young a child or a young adult, you could give the left lobe or the left lateral segment. So you could give the right lobe, you could give the left lobe, or you could give a small part of the left lobe, which is called the left lateral segment, depending on the size of the recipient. Who can be a donor? It could be a first degree relative or a second degree relative. It has to be ABO, ABO, ABO compatible. Traditionally, although we now start, have started doing ABO compatible transplant as well. And then there has to be an approval from an authorization committee, government approved. The donor has to be completely, completely healthy, typically between 18 to 50 years of age. We do a number of tests. Phase one tests that usually would be done in the home country itself then the phase two test and so on and so forth. When we look at the quality of the liver, the plain CT gives a very good idea about the quality of the, the amount of fat in the liver. Then we do a very sophisticated CT volumetry where we give an estimate about the size of the right lobe, the size of the left lobe. CT reconstruction has advanced to amazing levels where we can see all the vessels within the liver by removing all the parenchyma. So this is the veins within the liver, the portal vein branching within the liver, the arterial branching patterns within the liver. And then we decide, you know, much like a pilot uh, simulating a flight. So on the CT console, we can actually simulate our journey within the liver. So for example, here is the middle hepatic vein. And we decide, as you can see in the right red line that I've traced here, that which side of the middle hepatic vein we would traverse. Similarly, we know the branches of the arteries. So we decide, okay, this is where we are going to divide the right hepatic artery if we, were, if we are planning to harvest the right side of the liver. And so this is the basic idea 
of a living donor liver transplant. Unlike a kidney transplant, the native liver is removed in kidney transplantation. The native kidneys are not removed. The kidney transplant surgeons just put in an additional kidney. But in uh, liver transplantation, the unhealthy liver is completely removed. As a pathologist, you would understand that the idea is not just to give another liver which would function, but is also to remove the liver which is diseased so that the portal hypertension is completely corrected. Otherwise, the portal hypertension would not get corrected. So the liver is completely removed. And in living donor liver transplantation here, the right side of the liver, the right lobe is transplanted onto the recipient. I have discussed that there needs to be a balance between transplant benefit versus morbidity of waiting. But in case of living donor liver transplant, if you look at this uh, image a little carefully, you would identify that there is another element of risk involved, that is the donor. So there has to be a balance between the risk that we give to the donor, because whatever, however small the risk is, there is a small but finite risk in the donor, because the surgery for the donor is non-essential. So there has to be a balance between the need in the recipient and the risk in the donor. And this fine balancing act is very important. There may be a donor who has some small additional risk factor, but it would not be okay, justifying that the recipient is very sick. So that balance is the concept of the double equipoise of living donor liver transplant. We have to balance between the benefit to the recipient and the risk to the donor versus the risk to the recipient if we don't do the liver transplantation. Add to that now comes the risk of COVID. Imagine having a transplant being done in COVID. Not only is there the recipient outcome, the donor and graph safety, but you're also using healthcare resources. So there is a concept of quadripartite equipoise for liver transplant during a viral pandemic. Anyway, so that is a separate issue altogether. We sometimes have donors who have fatty livers. Very often we can just put them to a regimen, through a regimen of diet and exercise and bring down the fat content over a few weeks and then go ahead. If the blood group doesn't match, there is a concept of swapping between two families, uh, which is between, uh, you know, if someone has an A blood group donor and a B recipient, whereas the opposite combination is there in the second family, then it is possible to swap, but legalities are such that it has to be between families from the same country. So it can be tricky in an international uh, patient scenario. So the basic concept of the donor surgery is that the right hepatic artery, which I've highlighted here is divided. The right portal vein is divided. The right hepatic vein is divided and the right side so that the liver is transected along this ischemic plane. We have fancy equipment like the ultrasonic aspirator, which is here in action to divide. Here you can see that the liver is uh, divided between uh, two in two halves and here the separated halves are seen. Donor safety is very, very, very important in liver transplantation. Fortunately, touch wood, we have not had any major donor complications till now, but worldwide there have been unfortunate incidents. So there is a risk to the living donor of approximately 0.5% uh, in a right lobe donation. There are various checks and balances we have in place to ensure that the donor surgery is extremely, extremely safe. The operation involves removing of the liver. I will not go into the details. This is a cirrhotic liver, this is the IVC, and here the liver is completely taken out. Here you're seeing an arterial anastomosis, uh, which is the very, very important because it is done under magnification. You're seeing an, uh, a significant magnification here. That is why you're able to see it's a very fine anastomosis. Here is the new liver in action. Uh, 85 to 90 percent success rate at one year. There will be a mortality of around 10 to 15 percent over the first one to two years, less than uh, around less than 10 percent within the first few months. There is our biliary complications. There are other complications, but most of the complications are manageable. Post transplant, typically the patient would get intercavate and now tenofovir tap probably uh, lifelong indefinitely. That is kind of the standard practice nowadays. Hepatitis C, we would. Uh, depend on the probably start at four to 12 weeks if uh, there is no SVR before. We get a lot of patients with hepatitis D as well, 
uh, typically from Uzbekistan, which is not really a big problem in Bangladesh or India, but in Uzbekistan, it's a big, big problem. So we would uh, start and show that the patients are already on Intikavir or Tenofovir before transplantation. We would typically be happy to have undet undetectable hepatitis B DNA at the time of transplant. We would not use hepatitis B immunoglobulin, a, a practice which was standard a few years back, but it would not really be used nowadays. Post-transplant would continue Intikavir or Tenofovir almost indefinitely. Uh, stopping it would be a very, very tricky decision, and there's still no consensus. Uh, the outcome depends not on etiology much. We have uh, very good results with hepatitis C nowadays, hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B. Uh, acute liver failure does have higher infective complications post-transplant, and HCC, if it is within Milan criteria, then there's no difference in the outcomes, and we have very good long-term survivals now. So patients would continue on some medicines for a few months, but typically the immunosuppression would include tacrolimus and mycophenolate. In some cases, the alternatives could be cyclosporin or sirolimus or now more often everolimus. After two to three years, the patient would be only on tacrolimus. Uh, general measures to avoid post-transplant would be frequent hand washing, avoiding crowds during periods of high immunosuppression, uh, <clears throat> avoiding water from lakes, rivers, not very common nowadays, so not really much of an issue. Uh, protection from mosquitoes, sunscreen, not really an issue in countries like India and Bangladesh, but uh, in those uh, uh, Western countries, it would be a bigger factor because skin cancers are a little more common. Uh, we believe we are not only in the job of uh, changing livers, but hopefully we change a few lives as well. For example, this was a patient who had these big, big uh, veins, viruses, because she's suffering from Bacteria syndrome. Here you see, uh, I was happier than the husband. This is one of the earlier pictures. This lady I always show, and <clears throat> if uh, this was more interactive, I would ask you what, what would be the, how many liters of uh, ascites uh, do you think? So this lady actually had absolutely no ascites. And you see here that this is a, page, this is a lady who had huge hemangiomas of the liver. You can barely see any liver tissue, just the whites and a few island, uh, islands of the liver tissue remaining. Huge, huge, huge liver. And this is the tumor, the hemangiomas in the liver. And you can see the size relative to the uh, assistant's head to get an idea. And this is after the transplant, the same lady before the transplant. She was 60 kilos at the time of transplant and 29 kilos after the transplant. So you can imagine the kind of thing she was carrying inside. Uh, so thank you very much to the team because of which whom we were able to do this transplant and all the recipients and donors who are part. I'd like to end with this one image of a patient who is not my patient, I did not operate. So this is the world's first successful liver transplantation done by Thomas Tarzel in 1967. On a, baby and the child with biliary atresia. And this is the same lady you see here, 46 years after the liver transplant, she's still alive and doing well, which gives you an idea about what are the prospects of liver transplantation and the long-term survival of liver transplantation. Thank you very much. I would like to hand over the mic to the moderator. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramdeep Ray. Uh, I think uh, the talks were very uh, enlightening. And uh, unfortunately, we have taken a bit too long time. Uh, but that was very much worth it, actually, because uh, I, we are, I'm sure we, all of us have enjoyed the talks. But for the sake of time, since we have uh, the panel of experts, I think we'll skip the question and succession and uh, move directly to the uh, panel of experts. So first, it is my uh, pleasure to invite Dr. Abdullah Mahmood from Chittagong Medical College, who happens to be my very close friend as well, uh, to give his uh, expert opinion on today's uh, uh, day lectures. Hello, everybody. I think I am audible. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want, uh, I'd like to thank both the speaker, Dr. Pavan Ravel and Dr. Ramdeep. And uh, first, Dr. Pavan, uh, he was with hepatitis B. Actually, hepatitis B is a very vast issue. 
and uh, only 20 minutes it was very impossible to uh, focus on every corner but even then he uh, was very uh, elaborative and he uh, focused uh, light in every corner of hepatitis b and uh, one thing i want to share uh, is that uh, during treating or uh, during uh, targeting the patients to treat we have to consider the comorbidity because we are in the uh, phenomena of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, in the uh, NFLD era, we must consider the race ALT in an asymptomatic patient when uh, we are treating with hepatitis B. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, in this 28th July, uh, and definitely uh, it will uh, help us to refurbish ourselves. And uh, next, Dr. Ramdeep, uh, we are very much enlightened with the very basics of transplantation. And I think it will be very helpful for us. And uh, uh, finally, I want to thank uh, the uh, uh, Forum for Liver Studies in Bangladesh, and especially Professor Mamunal Mahatab, which is a dynamic personality and a unique person for hepatology in Bangladesh and also the Artemis group for, uh, uh, for their uh, uh, arrangements and especially Beacon Pharma for their uh, uh, entertainment. Thank you. So thank you, Mahmood. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Farah Dasen Mohammed Shahed from Dhaka Medical College Department of Hepatology uh, for his brief opinion, please. Dr. Shahid, if you please unmute yourself. Dr. Shahid, you are not audible. Uh, Shahid, we can't hear you. I think his headphone is not working. Oh. So, Dr. Sunan, you please uh, coordinate with Dr. Shahid while we take the opinion of the rest of some other panel members. So, it is uh, okay. my extreme pleasure to invite the rest of the panelists because they are all my direct students and now all are my colleagues. Now they are all teachers in different public medical colleges teaching uh, the students to become good hepatologists and good internists. So first I invite Dr. Syed Abul Fawaz from Silet M.A.G. Osmani Medical College uh, for his expert opinion, please. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Fawaz. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Professor Mamun al Madhav, sir, to uh, uh, give me the opportunity to talk uh, some few words. And first of all, I like to thank the both speaker to talk on about these very much time demanding topics as hepatitis B and liver transplantation. As hepatitis B is more common in our country and also in Indian subcontinent. And I think <clears throat> most of the liver transplantation uh, uh, in our country and both in uh, this subcontinent are due to hepatitis B related complication uh, such as uh, end stage liver disease. And both panelists are, is, uh, talk so nicely. Uh, the session will be more lively if question and answer session is uh, ongoing though is skipped uh, due to time constraint. And lastly and finally, I thank to uh, Professor Mamun al sir and Forum for the Study of the Liver uh, to <coughs> arrange such a nice discussion on web that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Farhad, can you uh, hear us now, Dr. Farhad? He can hear us, but uh, I think his speaker is not working. Uh, can you please uh, contact him soon and over the phone? Yeah, yeah, I'm contacting. I'm contacting. Okay. Him. So please let me know when he's ready, okay? 
So now uh, the next okay. uh, expert panel member is Dr. Abu Saleh Muhammad Salikul Islam. He's the head of the Department of Hepatology at SZM Medical College in Bogura. Uh, he's a uh, COVID survivor. He was suffering from COVID and I believe only a few days back. Uh, he has uh, tested negative and is back to work again. So Sadek, for your brief opinion, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I am honored for the, the panel of experts of this program. Uh, I'm excellent and outstanding lecture of our Dr. Ramdeep Rai and Paul Rawl, sir, for the time dependable subject in Bangladesh and uh, also in India. And I would also like to thank our moderator and my mentor, Honorable Professor Dr. Mamanul Mahathap, sir, for arranging such kind of uh, topics which is in this knowledge as well as in this in the uh, society of in Bangladesh. And I would also like to thank Forum for the State of Liver for arranging such kind of uh, topics and continuous uh, medical education. And also thanks Beacon Pharmaceutical for the logistic support. I uh, also hope future you will reach our knowledge in this aspect. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, next is yes. Dr. Ahmed. I think Dr. Next Shahid is ready. Oh, Shahid, okay. Please try, uh, if you can have your expert opinion, please. Dr. Farah Dosan Muhammad Shahid from Department of Hepatology, Dhaka Medical College. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I congratulate both speakers from abroad for their excellent presentation. This presentation have, is very helpful for us for our daily practice and our teaching purpose. Hepatitis B and C is very common in our country. And uh, the indication and uh, the Contraindication and side effect of hepatitis B and C antivirus um, uh, described by the speaker. For I also congratulate the second speaker who described the liver transplant. This is not available in our country, but in future it is. It will be started in our country. I also congratulate Professor Shobni. Uh, for his um, um, activities for our present in so I think uh, we lost connection again. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Farah, for your uh, brief comments. It is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Ahmed Lutful Mubin, who is an astronaut professor of hepatology at General Hospital in Dhaka. I must add a few words. Dr. Mubin is an active frontliner uh, in treating uh, COVID uh, patients. The hospital where his work is one of the earliest dedicated COVID hospitals. He's working there very uh, uh, sincerely and I must thank him in public because when I was diagnosed with COVID, my two of my colleagues, uh, you know, helped me with advice and treatment and one of them is Dr. Ahmed Dr. Mubin. So Dr. Ahmed Dr. Mubin, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank both the speaker for enlightening talk. That was very time demanding. And uh, as we are uh, running very short of time, we will not uh, speak much. But in recent COVID situation, sufferings of our liver patients greatly increased. And we are the doctors who are working in the COVID hospital are um, actually uh, our. Uh, capacity become very limited to treat the regular liver patient. So, uh, as we are running in very short time, I'd like to stop here and thank Professor Mamunul Mahathap sir and Beacon Pharmaceuticals for this nice arrangement. Thank you very much. Next, it will be, thank you, Mubin. Next, it will be Dr. Zia Haider Boshumia from Rangpur Medical College, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Hepatology there. Uh, first, I would like to thank my teacher and my mentor, Professor Mamunal Mahathap sir, for arranging such an excellent international life scientific webinar on behalf of Forum for the Study of Liver Bangladesh. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege for me uh, to be a part of this discussion. I must thank to Dr. Uh, Ramji Rai for his brilliant and precise talk regarding surgeon's perspective in hepatitis B virus and liver transplantation. And uh, also thanks to Dr. Pawan Rawal uh, 
for his excellent and elaborative discussion regarding hepatologist perspective of hepatitis B. I believe uh, we all participants here have gathered a lot of new things and new concepts from today's discussion. Today, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation poses an enormous challenges for us. Challenge is to promote telemedicine in outpatient settings and uh, prioritize outpatient contacts and also avoid nosocomial infections to uh, nosocomial virus to patients and to healthcare providers. And at the same time to maintain a standard care for patients who require immediate medical attention. In this COVID pandemic, one of the issue that whether uh, chronic hepatitis B can reactivate with the use of corticosteroids that is most often used in moderate COVID pneumonia and whether a HBS AG positive patient should be covered with antiviral therapy in case of prolonged corticosteroids uses and uh, whether hepatitis B core antibody positive patient should be treated with antivirals for the duration of steroid therapy in case of COVID treatment. So uh, before ending my talk, I would like to request Dr. Pawan Rawal to say something regarding this problem. Uh, so thank you all. So Dr. Pawan Rawal, if you uh, please kindly uh, do the favor of answering the questions raised by Dr. Ziyadar Goshunya, please. Uh, yeah, Dr. Zia, that's a very relevant question. Uh, let me tell you in brief uh, the data which has been there. Uh, CDC itself has published a lot of data where the people who had chronic hepatitis B, C or some other liver diseases in various stages, starting from asymptomatic carriers to the stage of hepatitis and stage of cirrhosis. Number one, uh, of course, if, uh, they have shown that if people had a significant chronic hepatitis or cirrhosis, or decompensation, they had increased chances of further decompensation and increased mortality, this is number one. Second, uh, the treatment, uh, as you are discussing. The treatment we have to take both ways. Suppose a person is uh, having COVID and he's planned for either remdesivir or maybe another therapy that's like tocilizumab or something like that. There is no contraindications. So if patient is having liver disease, either decompensated or compensated, the remdesivir and tocilizumab especially, I'm not talking of steroid except right now. So they can be, you know, given in these kind of people. The monitoring has to be significant. The COVID itself has been reported to the, uh, the COVID itself can cause actually transaminitis. So the transaminitis is part and parcel of COVID infection. So the monitoring of LFT is very important. The treatment can be taken care of. Now coming to the role of steroids. Yes, offload the dexamethasone has been used for COVID. Uh, the steroid, they actually don't fall into category of, uh, it, they don't fall in a category where the prophylaxis was previously being given in every patient. So the chemotherapy and immunosuppression therapy have been categorized. I mean, it's a separate topic though. The category have been divided where the top category is formed by the NTCD20, that's the rituximab group, then the stem cell and then the the steroid, they fall in the lower categories. So if you are giving short duration of steroid, like five days or 10 days, there's no significant role of giving the, uh, the prophylaxis for reactivation of Paris B. Now, this also falls into two categories. Suppose already the patient has a high DNA and he's uh, having a significant liver disease, then probably he'll be already on treatment. The question will arise only in asymptomatic carriers or uh, kind of people who have chronic hepatitis B without inflammation. So if you are giving a short duration of steroid, then probably the role of prophylaxis of antiviral is not there. Dr. Mamon, you are not audible. Sorry, uh, thank you, Dr. Pawan. Uh, I now go to Dr. Saiful Parvez. He's an assistant professor of hepatology at Mukta Medical College in Dhaka. He has seen both sides of COVID. He has been involved in treating uh, COVID patients in the hospital, which is a dedicated COVID hospital. And he's the first hepatologist to become positive with COVID and have come out very successfully. So he has seen both sides of COVID. So Dr. Saiful Parvez, please. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. 
Okay, first of all, I would like to pay my heartfelt gratitude to my teacher and mentor and uh, chairman of Department of Hepatology, Bangabandhu Shakhmoji Medical University, Professor Mahmoud Al Mahatab Shopnil, for giving me the opportunity as a panel of experts of this international seminar uh, webinar. And I would like to thank the two renowned speakers, Dr. Pawan Rawal and Dr. Ramdeep Ray, for their valuable speech and very fine speech on hepatitis B and liver transplantation. I will not take much more time. Uh, sir uh, has already told that I am the first hepatologist for being COVID positive and successfully uh, uh, <clears throat> come out from this and now also doing uh, my duty in, in a dedicated COVID hospital. hospital. Uh, so uh, everyone should be uh, careful uh, and cautious during uh, uh, their service to the patient in this pandemic situation. Thank you all. Thank you. And the uh, last uh, panel member today is Dr. Shaukat Hussain Romel. He is an assistant professor of hepatology at Sir Solimulla Medical College in Dhaka. Dr. Romel, please. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, give my special thanks and gratitude to uh, our honorable professor, uh, my mentor, Professor uh, Mamuna Mahatab Shopnil sir, for giving me the opportunity to talk here as a panel of experts and also give thanks to the Forum for Study of the Liver. And uh, uh, I must give uh, special thanks to both the presenters, uh, Dr. Pawan Rawal and Dr. Ramdeet Roy, for their very nice and elaborate presentation. Uh, I think most of the issues have been discussed here and uh, very little, uh, I think uh, all the issues have already discussed. And, uh, uh, but uh, I want to share an issue with uh, Dr. Pawan Rawal. He, uh, according to the question of Dr. Zia Haider Boshunia, he has mentioned that uh, uh, we, if uh, there is any need for prophylaxis of antivirals in case of moderate to severe COVID cases. Uh, I want to just share an issue with him that uh, if I start a uh, prophylaxis here, then uh, when, uh, how long we will continue this prophylaxis? As you know that uh, most uh, the moderate to severe cases, it is there is use of uh, uh, IL-6 uh, monoclonal antibody that is tocilizumab. So in that scenario, uh, after starting the prophylaxis prior to giving the uh, therapy, how long we actually continue these antiviral drugs? Okay, so basically the, everything is extrapolation, the extrapolation because uh, the experience with the COVID is very little. The, the proposed, the, the, uh, if you start the prophylaxis, as we continue the other situation, would be to cover this portion of the disease and three later on. So, the experience with it itself is very small and actually nothing happened in the past. So whatever has been done or being done is the exploitation of any other situation. So you cover this area. I mean, the disease may last maybe around two to four weeks and then three to six months later, you have to cover with the uh, antiviral if you are starting the prophylaxis. Okay. Um, next, I must thank to Dr. Ramdeep Roy for his very nice and uh, deliberate presentation over liver transplantation. We have learned a lot from the presentation. Uh, uh, I just want to share one thing with Dr. Ramdeep Roy. In this COVID situation, um, most of the countries, uh, most of the centers involved in the liver transplantation, uh, there is a huge impact over the organ allocation, uh, in, in, also in case of uh, liver uh, allocation. So uh, I have uh, seen uh, recently that there is a guideline uh, has been published in India uh, on March to 2020, that uh, they have outlined some issues regarding the uh, 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 liver transplantation. So my uh, question here is that uh, they have mentioned that we have to uh, think about, uh, we, uh, we have to prioritize the patient. Regarding the prioritization, we should think about a ALF, SCLF, patient of decompensated cirrhosis with high male score, and also patient with HCC. But uh, what is the issue regarding the acute on chronic liver, that is the ACLF, 
it is uh, do you practice there that uh, most of the uh, all the aclf cases you consider for liver transplantation there no we do uh, <clears throat> this is i think uh, the question is not uh, specific to in times of covid but in general you're talking about aclf so aclf uh, obviously the first line of treatment is medical and only on serial observation there are lots of scores there are lots of ways of looking at it but ultimately it's a serial observation of medical management by gastroenterologist and icu intensive care management and there are a subset of patients who we on serial observation see that the parameters are continuously worsening there is really very not a clear cut criteria no one can answer the question that which patients will recover uh, without a transplant but yes on the basis of serial monitoring those patients whose parameters continue to worsen we do offer them a uh, liver transplantation but very often the choice is limited by the availability of an organ and willingness of the family to take the decision it is never a clear cut case like in case of acute liver failure or in case of decompensated chronic liver disease but yes there is evidence worldwide that we, and we have uh, in our center also operated on patients with aclf with very gratifying results thank you thank you so much dr mamun mamun on me to herself so thank you romel with this we come to the conclusion of this session uh, before i conclude i must thank the participants uh, for uh, making this uh, webinar once again successful uh, thanks to the panel members you have devoted your valuable time extremely grateful to dr ram dipre and dr pawan rawal uh, you know uh, you have enlightened us a lot we are grateful to artemis hospital uh, the marketing team there miss anjali and miss pooja uh, for helping us and making it successful uh, the scientific partner of this event today was uh, Beacon Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thanks to them also, especially to Dr. Sunan, uh, who had gave us technical support for this program. Ramdeep Bapu and Pooja, I'm Rasha Kochi, post-COVID period, Haka Idish Khaar, Jama Dakha Vee, Aapna Dashat Hai. And uh, with that, we conclude, but the last uh, announcement on World Hepatitis Day on 28th July at 7.30 p.m., the forum could organize another webinar where we'll be discussing about the scope of plasma exchange, Plex, in acute and chronic liver failure and beyond, that is in COVID-19 patients as well. So Professor C. Yapen from Velo will be connected. Uh, hope to see you all there. We we'll notify you in time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. once again. Have a very good day. I would just like to uh, thank you all once again. I'm sure Dr. Pawan also would like to extend this thanks. And after you do Oshosti Laglo, Dr. Forad Hussain Johan Bolchilen, Uni Machkane Bolen. Dr. Pawan, excuse the Bengali. Sorry. So Dr. Faraz Hesan Johan Bolin, thank you to the speakers from abroad. It feels very awkward when Bangladesh and look, India look abroad. It's very difficult to imagine as abroad. We regard that as something else. Thank you very much and look forward to hosting every one of you in post COVID era in uh, Delhi, India. Thank you. Very thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. outpatient contacts and also avoid nosocomial infections to uh, nosocomial virus to patients and to healthcare providers. And at the same time to maintain standard care for patients who require immediate medical attention. In this COVID pandemic, one of the issue that whether uh, chronic hepatitis B can reactivate with the use of corticosteroids that is most often used in moderate COVID pneumonia and whether a HBS AG positive patient should be covered with antiviral therapy in case of prolonged corticosteroids usage and uh, whether hepatitis B core antibody positive patient should be treated with antivirals for the duration of steroid therapy in case of COVID treatment. So uh, before ending my talk, I would like to request Dr. Pawan Rawal to say something regarding this problem. Uh, so thank you all. So Dr. Pawan Rawal, if you uh, please kindly uh, do the favor of answering the questions raised by Dr. Ziyadar Goshunia, please. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, Dr. Zia, that's a very relevant question. Uh, let me tell you in brief uh, the data which has been there. Uh, CDC itself has published a lot of data where the people who had chronic hepatitis B, C or some other liver diseases in various stages, starting from asymptomatic carriers to the stage of hepatitis and stage of cirrhosis. Number one, uh, of course, if, uh, they have shown that if people had a significant chronic hepatitis or cirrhosis, or decompensation, they had increased chances of further decompensation and increased mortality, and this is number one. Second, uh, the treatment, uh, as you are discussing. The treatment we have to take both ways. Suppose a person is uh, having COVID and he's planned for either remdesivir or maybe another therapy, let's like tocilizumab or something like that. There is no contraindications. Uh, so if patient is having liver disease, either decompensated or compensated, the remdesivir and tocilizumab especially, I'm not talking of steroid except, uh, right now. So they can be, you know, given in these kind of people. The monitoring has to be significant. The COVID itself has been reported to the, uh, the COVID itself can cause actually transaminitis. So the transaminitis is part and parcel of COVID infection. So the monitoring of LFT is very important. The treatment can be taken care of. Now coming to the role of steroids. Yes, offload the dexamethasone has been used for COVID. Uh, the steroid, they actually don't fall into category of, uh, it, they don't fall in a category where the prophylaxis was previously being given in every patient. So the chemotherapy and immunosuppression therapy have been categorized. I mean, it's a separate topic though. The category have been divided where the top category is formed by the anti-CD20, that's the rituximab group, then the stem cell, and then the the steroid, they fall in the lower categories. So if you are giving short duration of steroid, like five days or 10 days, there's no significant role of giving the, uh, the prophylaxis for reactivation of Paris B. Now, this also falls into two categories. Suppose already the patient has a high DNA and he's uh, having a significant liver disease, then probably he'll be already on treatment. The question will arise only in asymptomatic carriers or uh, kind of people who have chronic hepatitis B without inflammation. So if you are giving a short duration of steroid, then probably the role of prophylaxis of antiviral is not there. Dr. Mamon, you are not audible. Sorry, uh, thank you, Dr. Pawan. Uh, I now go to Dr. Saiful Parvez. He's an assistant professor of hepatology at Mumta Medical College in Dhaka. He has seen both sides of COVID. He has been involved in treating uh, COVID patients in the hospital, which is a dedicated COVID hospital. And he's the first hepatologist to become positive with COVID and have come out very successfully. So he has seen both sides of COVID. So Dr. Saiful Parvez, please. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, first of all, I would like to pay my heartful gratitude to my teacher and mentor and uh, chairman of Department of Hepatology, Bangabandhu Shakhmoji Medical University, Professor Mahmoud Al Mahatab Shopnil, for giving me the opportunity as a panel of experts of this international seminar, uh, webinar. And I would like to thank the two renowned speakers, Dr. Uh, Pawan Rawal and Dr. Ramdeep Ray, for their valuable speech and very fine speech on hepatitis B and liver transplantation. I will not take much more time. Uh, sir uh, has already told that I am the first hepatologist for being COVID positive and successfully uh, uh, <clears throat> come out from this and now also doing uh, my duty in, in a dedicated COVID hospital. hospital. Uh, so uh, everyone should be uh, careful uh, and cautious during uh, uh, their service to the patient in this pandemic situation. Thank you all. Thank you. And the uh, last uh, panel member today is Dr. Shaukat Hussain Romel. He's an assistant professor of hepatology at Sir Solimulla Medical College in Dhaka. Dr. Romel, please. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, give my special thanks and gratitude to uh, our honorable professor, uh, my mentor, Professor uh, Mamunan Mahatab Shopnil, sir, for giving me the opportunity to talk here as a panel of experts and also give thanks to the Forum for Study of the Liver. And uh, uh, I must give uh, special thanks to both the presenters, uh, Dr. 
Pawan Rawal and Dr. Bagamdeep Roy for their very nice and elaborate presentation. Uh, I think most of the issues have been discussed here and uh, very little, uh, I think uh, all the issues have already discussed. On the, uh, but uh, I want to share an issue with uh, Dr. Pawan Rawal. He, uh, according to the question of Dr. Zia Haider Boshunia, he has mentioned that uh, uh, we, if uh, there is any need for prophylaxis of antivirals in case of moderate to severe COVID cases, uh, I want to just share an issue with him that uh, if I start a uh, prophylaxis here, then uh, when, uh, how long we will continue this prophylaxis? As you know that uh, most uh, the moderate to severe cases, it is there is use of uh, uh, IL-6 uh, monoclonal antibody that is tocilizumab. So in that scenario, uh, after starting the prophylaxis prior to giving the uh, therapy, how long we actually continue these antiviral drugs? Okay, so basically the, everything is extrapolation, extrapolation because uh, the experience with the COVID is very little. The, the proposed, the, the, uh, if you start the prophylaxis, as we continue in the other situation, would be to cover this portion of the disease and three, Later on. So the experience with COVID itself is very small and actually nothing happened in the past. So whatever has been done or being done is the exploitation of any other situation. So you cover this area. I mean, the disease may last maybe around two to four weeks and then three to six months later, you have to cover with the uh, antiviral if you are starting the prophylaxis. Okay. Um, next, I must thank to Dr. Ramdeep Roy for his very nice and uh, deliberate presentation over liver transplantation. We have learned a lot from the presentation. Uh, uh, I just want to share one thing with Dr. Ramdeep Roy. In this COVID situation, um, in most of the countries, uh, most of the centers involved in the liver transplantation, uh, there is a huge impact over the organ allocation, uh, in, in, also in case of uh, liver uh, allocation. So uh, I have uh, seen uh, recently that there is a guideline uh, has been published in India uh, on March to 2020 that uh, they have outlined some issues regarding the uh, 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 liver transplantation. So my uh, question here is that uh, they have mentioned that we have to uh, think about, uh, we, uh, we have to prioritize the patient. Regarding the prioritization, we should think about a ALF, ACLF, patient of decompensated cirrhosis with high male score and also patient with ACC. But uh, what is the issue regarding the acute on chronic liver, that is the ACLF? It is, uh, do you practice there that uh, most of the, uh, all the ACLF cases you consider for liver transplantation there? No, we do, uh, <clears throat> this is, I think uh, the question is not uh, specific to in times of COVID, but in general, you're talking about ACLF. So ACLF, uh, obviously the first line of treatment is medical and only on serial observation, there are lots of scores, there are lots of ways of looking at it, but ultimately it's a serial observation of medical management by gastroenterologist and ICU intensive care management. And there are a subset of patients who we on serial observation see that the parameters are continuously worsening. There is really very not a clear cut criteria. No one can answer the question that which patients will recover uh, without a transplant. But yes, on the basis of serial monitoring, those patients whose parameters continue to worsen, we do offer them uh, liver transplantation. But very often the choice is limited by the availability of an organ and willingness of the family to take the decision. It is never a clear cut case like in case of acute liver failure or in case of decompensated chronic liver disease. But yes, there is evidence worldwide that we, and we have uh, in our center also operated on patients with ACLF with very gratifying results. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Mamun, unmute yourself. So thank you, Romel. With this, we come to the conclusion of this session. Uh, before I conclude, I must thank the participants uh, for uh, making this uh, webinar once again successful. Uh, thanks to the panel members. You have devoted your 
valuable time. Extremely grateful to Dr. Ram Dipre and Dr. Pawan Rawal. Uh, you know, uh, you have enlightened us a lot. We are grateful to Artemis Hospital, uh, the marketing team there, Ms. Anjali and Ms. Puja, uh, for helping us and making it successful. Uh, the scientific partner of this event today was uh, Beacon Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thanks to them also, especially to Dr. Sunan, uh, who gave us technical support for this program. Uh, Ramdeep Babu and Pooja, I'm Rasha Kochi, post COVID period, Haka Idish Kartam, Haka after the Shate. And with that, we conclude. But the last uh, announcement on World Hepatitis Day on 28 July at 7 30 p.m., the forum could organize another webinar where we'll be discussing about the scope of plasma exchange, Plex, in acute and chronic liver failure and beyond, that is in COVID 19 patients as well. So, Professor C. Yapin from Velo will be connected. I uh, hope to see you all there. We will notify you in time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. once again. Have a very good day. I would just like to uh, thank you all once again. I'm sure Dr. Pawan also would like to extend this thanks. And at that time, also still a glow. Dr. Forad Hussain, who had told me, when he was coming, he said, "Dr. Pawan, excuse the Bengali. Sorry." So Dr. Forad Hussain, who had told me, "Thank you to the speakers from abroad. It feels very awkward." When Bangladesh and look, India look abroad, it's very difficult to imagine as abroad. We regard that as something else. Thank you very much and look forward to hosting every one of you in post COVID era in uh, Delhi, India. Thank you. Very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, outpatient contacts and